So now we know the moment of x. That's equal to the radial force times the quantity x minus l. And based on this equation up here, we can also write that as being equal to e times i times y double prime. So we want to find y of x. And just to make things easy, so I don't have to write out so much, let's set a equal to the radial force divided by ei. And then we can rewrite this differential equation. So the second derivative of y then will be equal to ax minus al. If we integrate once, we get 1 half ax squared minus alx plus a constant of integration. If we integrate a second time, then we'll get 1 6 ax to the power of 3 minus 1 half alx squared plus c1x plus a second constant of integration. So here's another question for you. We have these two constants of integration. If you think back to your differential equations class, how can we solve for these constants of integration? So you might have remembered correctly. Use, we need to identify and then use some boundary conditions to figure out what these constants of integration is are. So here's another question. How many boundary conditions do we need? Well, each boundary condition is essentially an equation. And well, here we have two unknowns because we started off with a second order differential equation. Because we have two owns, unknowns and because this was a second order equation, that means we need, we need two boundary conditions. So if we think back to what this situation is, it's, it's similar to a cantilever beam. And we have one main constraint over here on the left hand side with this fixed end condition. And it tells us two things. So first of all, it tells us that at x equals zero, the radial deflection is going to be equal to zero. But then it not only constrains us from moving the shaft or the beam up and down, it also constrains us from rotating it. So then we can say the first derivative at x equals zero is also equal to zero. So let's use the second boundary condition first. And if we plug these values in, so y prime of zero equals zero, and we look at this equation up here, then we end up with this. We have one half ax squared minus alx plus c1 equals zero. Well, if we plug in x equals zero here and here, then we're just left with c1 is equal to zero. OK, so now we need to use the second boundary condition y of 0 is equal to 0. And that then will give us this result, 1 sixth ax cubed minus 1 half ax squared. Now c1 we know is 0, so we can just add in this c2. That equals 0. Well, if we plug in x equals 0 here and here, well, that just makes this very simple. So c2 is also equal to zero in this case. So then we can conclude the solution or the radial deflection as a function of x is equal to this. This, If I substitute a back in, we have the radial force times x squared divided by six times ei times the quantity x minus three times l. Now, you're not expected to rederive these beam deflection formulas every time you're presented with a, a beam deflection problem or a shaft deflection problem.
And so there are a lot of tables that have been compiled to help you with this. So you can look this up in a table, this particular case, and you'll see that the solution in the table matches the solution that we derived. So the tables I'm talking about are found in your text textbook in the appendix. It's appendix 9.1. And if you have the same edition of the textbook as me, it's on page 1013. Okay, so in many cases we can just look up what the deflection formula is in either the table in the appendix or there are other more comprehensive tables that you can look up the solutions in. So what happens if our, uh, our particular loading condition or boundary conditions are not in a table. So there are really just a couple of options here. We can either one, go back and solve the ordinary differential equation, or we can use another principle knowing that we're dealing with small deflections which result in linear differential equations so that means that the principle of superposition applies. The basic idea behind the principle of superposition, it applies to solutions of linear differential equations. And let's say if y1 of x is a solution to a differential equation and y2 of x is a solution to a differential equation, then we can say that y1 of x plus y2 of x is also a solution to the differential equation. A really important thing to keep in mind is that it's valid only for linear problems. So if we have large deflections in beams or shafts, then this principle of superposition does not work. So let's go through a quick example. Let's suppose we have a shaft with four different points, A, B, C, and D. Let's suppose we have it supported by a bearing at A, and a bearing at D, so I'm drawing reaction forces here. And as you're going through any of these beam or shaft deflection problems, it's really important to draw out the free body diagrams to understand what all the forces are. So let's suppose we have a load, maybe from a gear or a pulley, at B, and then also another load at C. So we can decompose this into two problems. Let's say our particular table does not have this loading and boundary condition situation in the table, so we can't just look it up. And we can decompose this into two problems that are simpler, and those simpler problems are going to have a solution. So let's split it into two parts. So this first one, let's only consider the points A, B, and D. So we have a reaction force there, we have an applied force there, and another reaction force. So this is a simple situation that is in most tables, and we can look it up and get this solution, y1 of x. And then let's look at this case where we have a C and D. So we have two reaction forces and one applied force. We can look that up in the table, figure out what the deflection is. We'll call that y2 of x. And then we can superpose these. So the solution to the original problem, that's going to be equal to y1 of x plus y2 of x. So far, we have covered the case where the diameter of the shaft is constant. We have a uniform diameter through the entire length of the shaft. So this is a 
a rare circumstance in practice. So what happens when we need to analyze a shaft that has multiple diameters throughout the length or if we have a non-constant diameter? Also, so far we have only considered a few point loads on the shaft. What happens if we have a more complex loading situation? If we have torsion, if we have uh, axial loads on the shaft, then the situation gets a lot more complex. In the case of a non-constant diameter, we may be able to solve the differential equations, keeping in mind that the slope between transitions and diameter needs to be constant. In both of these cases, we may be able to use specialized software. Software that's intended for beam analysis. Also, many finite element analysis packages also allow you to analyze beams. We can look at really in a much higher fidelity what the stress throughout the beam or sorry the shaft is and also the deflection throughout the shaft.